Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Jim Butler with Vidiri Wealth Management. My guest tonight is Kelly Stewart, the principal of The Positive Business. Yes. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Jim. So we have an exciting show tonight. We do. Uh, certainly we have some things to talk about, but why don't we kick it off mm -hmm. uh, with a little bit about um, what companies today mm -hmm. can do, are doing, maybe should think about doing to be more responsible for to their employees and to the community in which mm -hmm. they are part of. Um, so why don't I simply ask you, based on your work sure. uh, with different clients that, you, that you're with, what are you finding in this arena? Mm -hmm. Lots of different um, business models are emerging. A lot are driven by social entrepreneurship models. So we see less of the traditional hierarchical organization where there's been and for good reason for many years right a lot of this kind of command and control type leadership and what we're seeing today is more of um, leaders as player coaches that if that makes a little bit more sense you know where they don't feel responsible to have all of the answers and set all of the direction but they do have the vision and they know where to get the answers and they know how to bring out the best in their team to achieve those objectives mm -hmm. and i think it's it's part and parcel of something much larger we're seeing where there's been a really significant shift in how we do businesses. Um, and I think a lot of that has been driven by the fact that the social contract that existed between business and people has kind of um, eroded. Is, okay. is what I will say over the last couple of decades. How so? What do you mean when you say you wrote it? Sure. Um, there was a time, a time that I remember really well, when if you had a job with a company, you had a job for life. Mm -hmm. They took really good care of you, and by that I mean they paid your health care insurance. And I'm not saying that any of these systems were perfect, but they paid your health care insurance. You likely had a pension. Layoffs were something that were really done only in the hardest of times, they weren't really hailed as um, kind of cost-cutting right. measures, right? Like, yay, you know, you've just saved a ton of money for the company by laying off 200 people. Right. They were really seen as something that was almost deemed as, as a failure um, of the management team for not being ahead of something like that. And, um, and I think, too, because that was a time where companies and their employees were more um, physically close to one another. So it was very hard to do a layoff if you were going to run into someone in your community at the grocery store, at church, you know. Um, and I think as globalization started, it became easier to do those things. Mm -hmm. And then certainly we saw a time where, you know, it became harder as costs went up for companies to continue to offer health care insurance, and that changed in how that was. And the same thing with pensions. Right. You know, and right. I remember actually, um, I was a young green bean at a company when they um, shifted us, as many companies were doing at the time, from a pension to 401k. And I remember looking around at the people that I worked with who were wonderful, skilled professionals in what they did. But I remember thinking, I'm not sure any of us <laughs> have the capability and the natural ability to really shepherd our own financial decisions on, on this scale. Right. And right. Um, I think it's we've things that we've seen play out in 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 the sphere where people today have less saved than they should. You you probably see some of that in your own business, um, and where people are now having to redefine themselves because they are being laid off from jobs and they have to kind of reinvent what they're doing. The technologies are changing, and I think for a lot of that, people have look at businesses to say, hey, so what does the new norm look like now that we don't have all of those things and right. we've experienced some pain around that right. what does it look like now and i along those lines i think uh, companies uh, from executives on down whether it's a small business or a larger mm -hmm. company are challenged to be able to change with times because yes. today is different than it was 10 years ago yeah. and even going back Five further than right that. exactly so mm -hmm. uh, not not drawing judgment as to should companies be paying 100 percent of health care should right. companies be providing a pension not not opening those doors mm -hmm. but simply saying it's different today right and costs have risen across the board so on the one side it's understandable that companies would change right. but i think what we're touching on is their level of responsiveness and responsibility to mm -hmm. help 
empower their employees, their community, yes. the clients or customers that they serve, yes. so they seem more cohesive. You, you hit the nail on the head, and I talk a lot about um, stakeholders, because it's not just your people, it's not just your customers, but it's all of the people who are essential to your success. So that's suppliers, that's vendors, as you touched on community, you know, what, what is going on in your neighborhood, your industry, and how can you affect more positive change in your industry. And so I think you're absolutely right about that. And it's not about going backwards in time, that's another great point that you mm -hmm. made. My father has this great expression, you know, we used to go out west in a wagon and we don't do that anymore, <laughs> right? So it's not about that, it's not about replicating what, what happened, but it's about defining what makes sense now. And I think it is why we're starting to see a lot of organizations really take a different look at some of the, what used to be softer skills, but we call them essential skills for success. You know, right. the emotional intelligence, the growth mindset in a time where business and well, the whole world is just changing so quickly. Organizations need to be agile and they still need to be profitable and that's definitely still on the table, right? right. But the organizations that are succeeding are the ones that have found a lot of ways to bring in business practices that are good for people, however you define that, all of those stakeholders, uh, society at large and the planet and still be profitable. And I think when we activate some of these positive triggers in people through benefits, through perks, through just the way we talk to people and, mm -hmm. and draw them into strategies and plans, then I think you see that you are better able to help them feel better about themselves, which it's all about the, the brain science, right? right? And so then that helps them to have be in a better place emotionally, which helps them to do their job better, which ultimately helps them create more value for the people the company serves. Right, right. I think um, you're right. It's like uh, the circle of the uh, private enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, win, win, win uh, situation. Absolutely. It's about creating a value network and not necessarily a value chain, right? Because even when we think about that, you know, think about that analogy, you know, here we have this chain and if you're a supplier, you're essential to my company's success and sure. in service to our client, right? right? And so if you're not doing something that's right or that you're charging me too much, right? Just, you know, picture that. I can just take out my bolt cutters and cut you off the chain and get another one. And what business leaders today are thinking about, no, we're all s essential to one another's success. Right. So when we recognize that interconnectedness, then we're better able to create this value web where we can brainstorm together for our clients and say, you know, what can we do? And well, there was a great example of that in just how suppliers for the larger companies will change some of their manufacturing or processing systems to be more environmentally friendly because the large companies can ask for that. Well, once it's there and it's in place, they can offer that to other clients who may not have the same type of brand or organization size that the larger clients do. Right, so. sure. Well, that ties right into uh, a question that a viewer uh, it has, has posed and that Roland Lewis okay. uh, is asking, what's the biggest need in solving business problems today? This may not be the biggest, but certainly we're touching on right. a partial solution. Absolutely. So how would you answer what's the biggest need? You know, I love the questions that the viewers send in on this show, and this is a great one because I really think when you boil it all down to the, some of the essential element, it's really about reframing challenges to be seen as opportunities, right? So that new ways of doing, like we're talking about, require new ways of thinking. And I think that when you stop the deficit-based thinking and the negative thinking around what's broken, what's missing, right? Then you can open yourself and the people who work for you and your shareholders or your investors up to the possibilities of what could we create for others. And you can't do that if you're only looking to think about what's broken or, or what's missing. Mm -hmm. But you can use strategic planning frameworks and decision-making frameworks that are more strengths-based and more based on what have we done successfully in the past that we could use as a springboard for the future. And that, oh, by the way, happens to benefit people on the planet and are profitable. Right, right. Okay. Great question. Good, yeah. So if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. 
and you can write in to let us know and hopefully you will get on air. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com our guest tonight is david lyman with surf pro of central chester county welcome david hi jim great to have you on the program and uh, an opportunity to learn about uh, what you do what surf pro does and uh, how you serve the community similar to what we just talked okay. about so maybe a good starting point is to help our listeners understand what is Surf Pro, and where do you fit into the business community? Okay, uh, Surf Pro is a uh, national fire and water cleanup and restoration company. Um, we are franchised locations. I own an individual franchise location. There are uh, approximately over 1,800 franchise locations across the United States and now into Canada. Um, Surf Pro has been active in the uh, in the country for 50 plus years now and uh, my personal business has been 32 years in the Chester County region outside of Philadelphia. So from a geographic standpoint your a good chunk of your business is in Chester County but my guess is there have been plenty of times where you've, you've expanded beyond that. Correct, correct. Uh, um, Probably 90% uh, of the business is done within the county. Okay. But if I have uh, a, a customer outside in, 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 in Montgomery County or Philadelphia or somewhere that needs our uh, initial services, we do travel to them to help out. Right. So what happens when you run into a fellow ServPro uh, business owner like yourself who is in another area? Do you end up working together or you simply have uh, like a, a, a professional agreement amongst yourselves? It, it's more of a professional agreement, yes. Um, if the job entertains size and it is larger, a, a, a large commercial building or something needs this restoration from water or fire, um, we do team up together because our offices may not be large enough to handle it in an effective manner. So okay. we'll bring uh, each individual offices in and, and team up and it works very well right that way. right mm -hmm. well you have competition as yes, well yes, so certainly. here's what might be a softball question but i think it's an appropriate one which is what makes surf pro different and what makes you unique um the franchise system i think makes us a little more unique okay because uh, it it builds um we have stages of development when you come in as a, as a local franchise and we have a, a, the franchisor and we also have trainers and directors in the middle of the, the level that help um, keep us in focus and, and build our businesses and build them properly. So we're almost, uh, for lack of better words, we're like a McDonald's. You build a hamburger a certain way okay. and every McDonald's does it the same way. We try to do the same type of system with the cleanup and restoration. Right. It's not an exact science. It's not like putting a car back together once your car's hit, but it's very similar. Very similar. We do the same steps. And I would imagine whether it's a, a commercial location or residential that you're coming in contact with people that feel like chaos has just hit them and they can't wait to get back to a normal life yes. so to speak that that's one of the, the the nice positive things that comes about it that we get to help people in need um, we're emergency serviced so they need us now and we are acting quickly and we're helping them restore their their uh, house and or building back to a its user level again so what would you say in, in your 32 years of business are a couple of the big changes that you've seen from the way it used to be 
to the way you operate today? Um, it was back when I started, it was uh, the owner and an assistant on a truck. And it started out as a two-man team on a truck. Wow. And it built a little bit from there. So the owner was hands-on a lot. Okay. Um, today's day and age isn't like that. It's, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we, we build businesses and they're, they're larger. The owner actually operates and manages the company. And you have the levels underneath that actually do the work out in the field, do the work in the office. Uh, so they're much, they're much bigger structured uh, in running that way. And also with the information technology we have now, it's, that's the major, major change in Can how you give business us an operates. an example of that? How, how is that changing it? Well, um, it, before it was all hand paperwork. Mm -hmm. Now, um, technicians that do the, uh, the work in the field, mm -hmm. when they come out to greet the customer, they have an iPad and they're signing agreements and so forth on the iPad. They do um, all their uh, sketch information of, of the site they're working on and their, the information of what they've done mm -hmm. to um, do the emergency service restoring on the, on the iPad as well as reading temperatures and humidity levels in water damage situations. Right. So everything is now technology driven on an iPad and we're able to see that um, on time in the office as well because it's on the cloud and we mm -hmm. can also upload all these pictures and documents and information directly to the insurance company within hours. Right. Where before it was what fax machines and yeah. mail, it's slow, you know, things like that. Right. So that's one of the things that's changed so in some dramatically. Ways it is kind of like you're on the road with them if uh, they're yeah. using that type of technology mm -hmm. where, you know, not you maybe specifically, but there's a team back at the office at the home base that can be kind of riding along with them in some ways. That is very correct. Right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What do you see as maybe one of the major or some of the ch uh, major challenges? Uh, as, as you look forward, say, five years, ten years from now, with the uh, work that you do? Well, it's more with this information technology. It just keeps getting driven to another level. <clears throat> uh, the, the insurance companies that we work for mainly, I didn't talk about that earlier, but we do a lot of work with insurance companies. Okay. And they want this information quickly, and they're instead of sending the adjusters in the field, um, they're limiting the adjusters in the field, and we're kind of doing the work for them mm. with all this service of documentation and photos and things like that. So that's kind of it's getting driven more, more and more that way, that we're the big supporter and cutting their cost, helping them out. So they want to be efficient for profitability Correct. reasons. Yes. And consequently, they want you to be yeah, as well. Doesn't help us efficiently, <laughs> right. but that is part of the program we need to do to be uh, on their programs to get the work. If they, you know, help us and, and initiate the call to us and say you need, you have a job and at location X, there you go, and then we go and, and do it immediately. It sounds like, Dave, that given the people in the field, that not only can they um, be, a, be more efficient because of technology, but you can be in more than one, in several places at, at once, working on several different jobs, whereas before you didn't have that level of efficiency. That's pretty much correct as well, yes. Um, so now the efficiency level is, is all over the schedule board. I mean, you have, if you have six, seven, eight jobs going on in a day, the same efficiencies op operating on each on each job, and they're all communicating with with the office, and the office communicates with uh, the company or the the homeowner or the, uh, the building owner. So the communication level is is 100 percent more effective. Do you find insurance companies easy or difficult to deal with? Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of them are very easy, some of them are very difficult. It, it's right? across the board. Yeah, there's, there are some companies as a, a franchisee that you may not do a lot of work with because of their extreme stringent operations. Uh -huh. And uh, same thing with the franchisor. They have national account agreements with certain larger companies. 
um, and they put together these programs and this is what we do for them and what they can do for us. So it's a win-win situation that way. So they're, they're the ones that um, we operate with best because we know exactly what they want and we try to every day give them what they want. Okay. And consequently, they're calling you back they for the exact same Repeat reasons. business. Repeat business is always great. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. In thinking of how the, the business has changed, and you, you said, you know, you do, you're maybe not in the field as much anymore. What do you think are some of the, the traits or the skills that people in the field will need going forward? Like, um, and we talked about that, you know, you're dealing with people in a moment of chaos and crisis. Um, do they need to be part psychologist? And, <laughs> you know, like, how does that all work? What will make them successful yeah. five years from now, ten years from now, assuming that the technology continues on the, the, yeah. at the rate of change that it's on? Yeah, the technology is there, but the, the training level is, is the key as well now. Mm -hmm. more, more training. Uh, we do a lot of training. Uh, they have their own modules that they can look at on, on a computer and sit down and they take a little test afterwards that oh, they okay. understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So all the new, some of the new things in the field of how to do a specialized cleanup service or a mm -hmm. special, you know, a biohazard cleanup or something, mm -hmm. they get trained more effectively and they also get trained with dealing with the customer one-on-one -on -one and right. how to greet them and, sure. and, and how to, you know, s supplant a, a, a problem situation with it with a customer so right. there's a lot of training is where yeah. it really is that's good good mm -hmm. to know I would imagine finding good people that have all of those skills from the technical side to the people side uh, is not easy but when you find somebody that's good you want to hang on to them very very correct Jim we do and, and in my business we do a good job of hanging on to them okay. once we train them because mm -hmm. training costs a lot of money yeah, you know, once you get them up to the speed, and it is a good person that knows how to do the work and also deal with the customer situation every day. So we, we pay them a little better than most people. And we, we give them some benefits that some companies do not give. So we, we, we treat them a lot better, I'd say, more fairly. Mm -hmm. And that way they'll stay more years. Now, in our type of business, though, there is a burnout type of business because they, they're physically working as well. I mean, it's not all roses out there. They're, they're, they're lifting and they're moving and they're, it's a lot of effort out on the field part of it. And some people as they get older don't want to do that type of work anymore. So right. then it's, that's how you have to bring the newer, younger generation in and right. try to work them that way. Right. Well, that kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier with regards to treating your employees fairly, mm -hmm. running, wanting to run a more responsible mm -hmm. type of yeah, enterprise. Kelly was talking about that. It was yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because you know it is. It's I think it's something like 1.5 times. If re you know to replace an employee costs that much money. Yeah, I mean, there's a real bottom line impact to that. That so to keep an employee and to invest in their training is oftentimes less expensive than it is to replace mm -hmm. them. When you figure in the cost of hiring, recruiting, onboarding, the training, mm -hmm. all of that, yeah. So one of the things that, that I'm curious about, we touched on this a little bit uh, before the show started, and that is as a business owner yourself, at some point you want to be in a position to not only move on to the next phase of your life, but you are going to do that after you've created your current business at that higher efficient level, going back to some of the things that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So how do you develop or how have you been developing what may become your ultimate exit strategy at some point? Well, um, with the franchise location uh, organization, um, we have what we call a stages of development model. So they, the franchisor kind of puts everything in place. And if you follow the mm -hmm. system and you follow it correctly and you put the right people in the right places, you know, for marketing, for the office, for, the, for you know, as you build your business, you have different lo levels of positions as well. And if you build it properly, it, it will, can self-manage. So uh, as an owner now of 32 years, I have the ability to go away for a couple weeks at a time. And all I do is 
maybe touch base with the business by email. I'm, it operates, it can fully ma operate and it is fully managed on a level there. Um, and if it's done correctly, it can be profitable. So the other thing is being profitable. Um, and you want to show good books. So if you're showing good books for three or four years and you're thinking about exiting, um, that's what they want to see. If you want to sell your business, they want to see it being profitable. Right. Not that it's doing five million or ten million, profitable. Mm -hmm. They can then they can manage it properly. Right. Right. Okay. Awesome. Do you um, do you see anyone within your current business? Not I'm not suggesting any names. I'm just saying uh, where you might be able to train that person, and then if they show an interest to at some point say, I might be interested in running this at some point. Is that kind of the ideal I, position to that, be in? That is for certain people, it certainly is, but I don't think so in my, um, I'm, I'm gaining age and as I gain age, <laughs> I kind of, when I do want to exit, I want to exit and somebody pay me the full amount of, right. of dollars for business. So as somebody within my company, they're not going to have those funds, I okay. don't believe mm -hmm. so. Okay. I need somebody it comes with um, maybe they worked for IBM for 20 years and they're done with that and here they want to manage a business mm -hmm. and they have income that they've saved and and they have uh, an investment that they can buy mm -hmm. that's the kind of person I think I'm looking for so not necessarily a person or a, 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 a couple people that have specific experience in your field but rather business experience being able to run the business because you've put that in place. Correct, very much so. It's a, it's a business to operate now rather than you operate on the business. Mm -hmm. so. Right. So 32 years, you've used that number a couple of times. I have to yeah. ask this question. <laughs> you must have seen a lot. I certainly have. What have you seen? What really sticks out in terms of what you've responded to in this chaos and crisis mode? I'm sure that there have been a lot of different scenarios. Is there something that sticks out for you as like, wow, I didn't think we'd ever see that kind of a moment? Uh -huh. Or do they do just kind of fall into, you know, just a pipe has broken or there's been a devastating fire, but it, are there other things that, that you would respond to that, that most people wouldn't necessarily think of? Okay, um, there certainly is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Short answer, we're running low on time, but go. Biohazard cleanup. Really? Okay. Yeah. Was, in other words, uh, cleaning up after a dead body of some sort with okay. a shooting or something like that. Wow. And, and we just did one yesterday where okay. it was a suicide. It was a shame to mm -hmm. see, but I, I got the graphic pictures mm -hmm. um, from my, uh, right. uh, my estimator when first went out and saw it. So. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that really sticks in your mind, and it's not a really nice thing to do, but somebody has to has do to it. Has to do it. Right. Well, right. that's not necessarily the best note to end on, but we <laughs> okay, do have But there is someone, frame. they're doing it. That's so. right. It's right. good to know there's people to, okay. to fall yeah. back on. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, taking the time. Uh, our next guest is Dr. Martin Phillips, who's the CEO of a comp biopharmaceutical company called Obsidio. Uh, sounds exciting and cutting edge. And in the meantime, thank you for listening again, and we look forward to the next one.